Rickshaw Bags is a brand that you probably have heard of before through maybe in passing, maybe you've seen their Instagram account. That was actually how I got reacquainted with them the other day. I was looking over Instagram, saw Rickshaw Bags, found that I followed them, and they were sharing something called the Micro Plush Pouch. And uh, this is actually the Micro Plush Pouch Plus, and uh, we'll go over that here in just a moment. But it was really neat to see uh, them creating something new and something EDC, really EDC focused. Now they've always been EDC focused. They've had bags, they've had uh, specialties in pens and notebooks and all those different things. So I was delighted when Mark Dwight, the CEO and founder of Rickshaw Bags got in touch and wanted to talk to me about the channel here. He wanted to see if I'd be interested in getting some gear from him. And uh, of course I said yes, but I asked him for a little bit more. I said, would you like to come on and let me interview you? Let me talk about Rickshaw. Let me uh, go through how Rickshaw got started and talk about what he's focusing on now. And he agreed. And so after we review the gear here, we're going to go to the gear first. There's a long, great discussion that I was able to have with Mark Dwight. And I haven't edited that hardly at all. And uh, you'll get to see it in its entirety. And it'll be down in the chapter markers below. But let's take a look at the gear that he sent along. There's some really interesting EDC gear. Again, Rickshaw has been concentrated on bigger bags, pouches, um, sling bags and laptop bags over the shoulder kind of bags but these these are micro bags and they've got some pretty rad designs on them he was able to actually if you can see put my he was able to actually put my logo on these so I really love that as well I'm really looking forward to showing you a couple of these bags they're just neat little micro plush pouches and uh, let's go ahead and take a look okay what you see here is all the stuff that uh, Mark sent me from Rickshaw Bags. This is just a Master Sword RE I got uh, in the mail today. This is a lot of great stuff. Let's go over the Micro Plush pouches first and we'll check those out. Here is the pouch Micro Plush Micro Plush. Here are the Micro Plush pouches and Micro Plush Pouch Plus. That's a that's a mouthful, but it is. Uh, it lives up to its name. So this is a micro plush, plush pouch plus. Now I've got some uh, a marker set in here actually for my little boys. They love uh, markers. So I've got all the. Look at that. I've got all those markers uh, in this tiny little plush bag. Now that's not necessarily what that's designed for, but I really do like these bags. Now he customized these with. This, uh, this wild design on it, I really like it. I was actually able to get my logo on there, as you can see. So that's, um, that's really awesome. And he gave me a couple of different colors. I told him I kind of liked, uh, you know, red, that pink that I have for my channel color, and of course, orange. And uh, then he made the orange interior. These actually have the matching color interior as well. And in this one, these are these are a little bit small. And these I like to keep my tactile turn pins. And I've got several in here. Um, probably wouldn't recommend putting these together because they'll rub and scratch each other together. But if you wanted to keep one or two in there, um, this is the perfect size for those. Now, for a regular size pin, it's not going to fit necessarily. So you're not going to be able to use these as like a regular pencil pouch that's a regular size pin but for something a little bit shorter your EDC pins um, you're gonna be able to fit those in there as well and I like what they've done here because you can fit knives of all sizes inside just the micro plush pouch so that fits really nicely this is a, a QSP penguin right here it's a pretty good size knife um, fairly cheap but you can see it fits in here just fine and that will be a nice little pouch uh, this is ideal I believe I don't have any like really really expensive knives uh, I just picked up obviously uh, this this gear for life uh, fast eddy and uh, really like it a lot uh, it's got a titanium scales on it as well as I've got a titanium bead on here from Peter Atwood and it fits in there really nicely so you can see uh, how that fits in there, but these are just the perfect size for like pocket knives that maybe you don't want to get scratched anywhere 
Now again, these micro plush pouches are not very big at all. Uh, you can see the size comparison here with the QSP. And I'll go ahead and put the Warrior 3 Mini in here as well. You can actually fit a full-size Warrior in here. It's a little snug, but I can fit a full-size Warrior in there as well. I don't know why you'd necessarily want to do that, but if you don't want to get it, if you don't want to get it scratched up or whatever, this is a really neat little bag. Um, but you can fit things of all sizes. You can throw some different things in here. So that's a Baton 3 actually in there. And um, here's another size comparison. A This is a NAFS Lander 1. And this has got, of course, those uh, Sagiha, I believe. The Sagiha, um, Sag, Sag, I can't even say it. Forget it. Uh, it's got these uh, really nice uh, scales on it as well. Haven't done a video about this one yet. I just got it. But um, you can tell if I wanted to keep this in really good shape, you just put that in there like so and zip her on up. Very, very nice to be able to look at that. You can put a number of different things in here. You can make these your little tool bags if you wanted to. So say I wanted to take the plush pouch right here I wanted to fit uh, a pry bar fit that in there I wanted to fit a tool the Gerber arm bar here orange nice matches and I've got my um, driver and I can even fit some small drivers in there but look at this little size pouch and you've got the orange plush inside of there it's just really neat a little neat little package something to throw in there and uh, I love the plush interior because that's going to keep your stuff uh, from getting messed up, especially if you put something that's high dollar in there as well. So love these little micro plush pouches. He advertised these on his Instagram and I was really taken with them. He actually was really funny. He got in touch with me the next day. And so check these out. These are on rickshawbags.com. And uh, again, thank you, Mark, for sending these my way. All right, as we look at these, let's go from let's go from smallest to biggest here. So you've got the Snap Wallet here, and this is just a super duper simple wallet. It's got pockets on either side for cards. Let's check out some cards in this thing. And so if I just put some cards in the side here, you'll see how they fit. And you've got pretty good size room for a bunch of different cards. And you've got a pretty good opening here for some cash if you want to fold it up as well. Um, but it just got one little snap. It's made from this X-Pack material right here. I was told in the video, if you'll see, if you'll watch later on in the, in the um, interview, he actually said the difference between X-Pack and um, the regular, I forget whatever he called it, something text or whatever, uh, is the square material here and so we'll talk about this one next but that's your that's called the snap wallet uh, and you can get that at rickshawbags.com this is the dash wallet and uh, you'll notice a resemblance to some more popular uh, wallets uh, namely i think about the topo designs and of course the alpaca wallets uh, that you can find but this one's got a nice little business card size um, piece of velcro on it you've got a little you've got a little tag here for things for like uh, putting on a, a little tiny carabiner but what I really like about this and I talk about this of course in the end of the, the interview and I'll have those chapter links marked below so make sure you check out what he has to say about these uh, wallets as well so if you don't watch the interview then make sure you check out what he has to say but I love this open tooth uh, YKK zipper that we've got here. It seems to be a lot more fluid um, than some of the other zippers. I've noticed that on some of the uh, zippers, especially with some of the waterproof ones, that they can be really tough to just open. But this right here seems really good to be able to open. So the idea here is that you would put, you know, a patch or two on here and you would have um, your cards you have your cards like so, and it seems to me like there's a little bit more room in these 
uh, for cards and for cash. They even include this little plastic, handy plastic sleeve for putting like clippings and business cards and uh, different things like that. So you can actually trim this to your liking, but you can actually keep that. It's really super thin, as you can see. And so very nice. I really think what sets this apart is that its size, it's five inches versus like 4.75 or four and a half uh, with some wallets. They're a little bit shorter and therefore a little bit tighter to get cards in and out of like you do need to do with a wallet. And so this is a cool little wallet. It's got a lining interior of, of a bright orange of interior. And check out their website for, of course, the Snap Wallet, but also the Dash Wallet and some of these other designs. They've got a bunch of different fabrics and colors. These are just the the orange kind of, um, you know, Tennessee orange, hunting orange kind of stuff that you're looking at here. I really like this wallet, really love this quick zipper, of course. Um, I said about this is a lot smoother than the waterproof zippers, and this is not gonna be a waterproof bag, but as you can see, you could probably drop this in a puddle uh, or something like that, and it would be just fine. If you had stuff inside, it would probably be just fine. This is akin to the Snap Wallet. You'll see it's almost like a big version of the Snap Wallet here. And this is the Field Notes slipcase, or excuse me, Field Notes folio. And you can see here it fits a full size um, slip, it fits a full size notebook here. And this is just a, his supply. We'll talk about that here in the video as well. But you can actually put these in. This is a really cool little, um, this is a really cool little folio for you note takers out there. And what you can do is you can put a pen right here, put that over like that, close it up, and you just got just a little bit of bulge there. But that's a really neat little package, and of course X Pack on this one. But there, of course, there's a, a million other different colors and designs that they have on their website. And they include uh, some little things like this, property of and efficiency supply was his kind of sub brand. And he talks about that in the, in the video as, as well. So that's a really cool, it's a field notes folio. And a little, little bit of save the best for last. I love this one right here. This is the diplomat. Uh, the Diplomat Field Notes slipcase, and you'll notice you've got some areas here for a full-size pen. You can put a full-size pen there. You've got a place for a bookmark or some cards. They include this plastic sleeve right here for it says business cards, clippings, you know, stickers, misc, anything like you want to put in there. You can use that or not use that. Of course, you've got some a big thing of Velcro here on the front that you can put some. Uh, patches. You've got a little tiny little thing right here on the side where you can attach a tiny little carabiner if you wish. But where the magic is, is the back. You've got another um, kind of rickshaw staple here with this so you can keep stuff categorized. Again, you can keep that in there or not, but you can fit up to three field notes size notebooks in this little sleeve. Again, this is the diplomat sleeve. You can put sort all sorts of stuff on it here. You can put ranger eyes, however you would like. You can actually use this other pocket for other pins if you so choose. And so you can actually have a whole set of pins in here if you'd like. And then you can you can actually fit. I love the interior right here. It's kind of got this graph paper uh, interior. And then you can actually. Um, Come over here and just put your slide your notebooks in there, and it does fit um, two or three size notebooks, and that's just really cool little package right there. Now the interview is coming up next, and it's a long interview, but I've broken it up into chapters. And so if you want to fast forward to the chapter where we talk about where he talks specifically about the gear here, uh, make sure you find that chapter below. But thank you so much. Here's the interview with Mark. I really appreciate you watching as well. So you're in Tennessee, is that right? Yeah, Columbia, Tennessee. It's about 40 minutes south of Nashville. Okay. Yeah, really nice little place. Booming, booming place. There's tons of people actually from California and New York that are moving here. Uh, yeah. I see the license plates all the time. So it's, it's actually really uh, fantastic because that brings in a lot of people, but also a lot of um, places are opening in town. It's one of the 
I think Columbia was named one of the best cities to live in if by some oh, really? a couple of magazines right now. So yeah, it's a oh, it's a that's really great. nice place. Yeah. I know um I know Tom uh notorious EDC just moved from New York to Tennessee. Okay. So I've got him yeah. on my list to talk to as well. And uh um, yeah. I saw that his address said Franklin and I'm like, Franklin is just south of Nashville by like twenty minutes. And oh, is it? Oh, that's yeah. Awesome. And it's, I mean, it's 20 minutes from here. It's basically halfway between here and Nashville. And I was, I just reached out to him cause I'm actually trying to specifically highlight some Tennessee creators as well. So. Yeah. Um, Medvedich is his last name. He's a great guy. We know each other, um, entirely over the internet, but, um, he, uh, he initially reached out to me because I made a small case resembling a, um, um, goldfish bot you know goldfish the the crackers yeah uh they did, they did a collaboration um with old with old bay um the seasoning oh yeah the seasoning company. one of my one of my favorite things and so they they did a seasoned version of goldfish with that and so i made a i made a koozie i made one of our little koozie cases out of that and then i had i bought a case of the crackers and i filled up the koozie case which is exactly the same size as the goldfish bag and slid it in one of the slots inside the case, and then we taped it back up. And then I did this video of me opening the case, <laughs> pulling out the Kizzy case, dump, dumping out the goldfish into one of our ballet trays, and then eating them. And he he reached out to me and says, you know, I have this friend who's just an absolute fiend for goldfish. Can I buy one of those cases? And I said, well, I can't I can't sell you one, but I can give you one. <laughs> and uh, so we became friends. And then um, he had a little issue with some material that was being used by his uh, the contractor that in china that's been making his um, all good pouch yeah. and so i helped him through um it was it, the crisis was just him being worried about it and so we spent a few hours talking about that and so um he's become a good friend of mine and we've that's, traded traded that's good great. it's a small world out there man it's yeah it really it's, is <laughs> and it's so good to have people to bounce stuff off of that are in the around, in and around the same industries i couldn't imagine yeah. the the supply and the and the demand that you guys have and all sorts of different stuff especially with some of his stuff is milled out of like metals and things like that yeah. like every one of his things sells out just really really quickly so oh yeah, yeah. he does the fomo game exceptionally well <laughs> he does he does a lot that's a lot that's a trend in edc for sure absolutely yeah. we've we haven't you know i'm i'm not i'm not a huge fan of it i mean I, I see it i observe it but the fact that i make everything to order it's sort of a it would be disingenuous of me to say well you know um i can't make any more of these uh, because unless i used a material that for some reason was you know, vintage and right. or you know, just old stock that you only have a certain amount of. You know, I I can make anything again. <laughs> once I've made it once, I can make it again. And so we've we've not done that kind of uh, constrained batch sort of thing. And so um, I I don't I don't rule it out, but it's not a marketing strategy that I've really embraced. But I I watch it happen, and in fact, I've hoped that we could kind of be the antidote to that mm -hmm. because. You know, a lot of these pouches that sell out, the reason they sell out is because one guy's in a garage mm -hmm. making them and you can only, well, literally and figuratively in a garage in the case of garage gear. And, uh, you know, whether, whether that person has help or not, you know, they can only make so many. And so they make them in batches and they throw them out there and, you know, obviously everybody, everybody goes for it and it, it, they're gone in an instant, mm -hmm. but it leaves a lot of people very frustrated and, uh, and people who've got other things going on, you know, they're not just sitting around all day waiting to do the latest drop, you know, and try right. and snipe product for themselves. And so, uh, you know, my hope is that over time they'll realize, well, yeah, I might want to get one of those because I want to support that maker. But when I really want one, I'll go to rickshaw because they'll just make it in whatever color I want now. <laughs> and that was going to be one of my first questions. So we're, I'm recording, I've got everything going here, but I'm going to use some of the stuff we just talked about, just getting introduced here. But that was one of the things that I wanted to ask you guys about is, you know, I know that, that I went on your site and I mean, everything looks, it, I didn't see sold out everywhere, which is kind of crazy <laughs> because you go on people, you know, and, and again, talking about Tom and Notorious, you go on his site, sold out, sold out, sold out, sold out. Yeah. And it's like, well, he's one guy. But you guys actually have a shop there in San Francisco. You have uh, how many employees do you have? Two, three? I, I have um, I have nine employees. Nine. And okay. So okay. 
but it's me and a and an office mate and then the rest of the the other eight people are in my factory okay so i mean the interesting thing is i'm actually well i'm twice i'm twice as big as tom yeah. right because i have two people he is one mm -hmm. but i have my own factory and he uses a contract factory so Technic, I mean, in a way, if I were to just say, well, I'm just going to contract my stuff out, um, it would just be me and my office mate, Cheryl, here, who, who recently joined the company. But for a long time, it was just me and the factory. And so people have this idea that we're much bigger than we really are. Um, you know, I mean, look, eight people in production, that sounds like a lot of people when you're one person, right. you know, working, working in your living room. It's still a very company. small business, yeah. But it's a very small business. And, um, and so, you know, and it's, 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 a, it's, it's a hustle, you know, no matter what level you're at, um, being a small business is a challenge. I live, I, you know, I'm, I'm doing this in one of the most expensive places in the world to do it. Yes, you are. City of San Francisco in a building that I do not own, uh, and, uh, with one of the highest minimum wages in the country. So, and therefore the world. And so, um, you know, we, it, it's, it's a niche business. It's a business that I love. I'm further far enough in my career that, you know, I, I can afford to do this, but, um, <laughs> no, you know, nobody in their right mind would, uh, start a sewing factory today in San Francisco. As a matter of fact, we will probably, I mean, we're one of the few remaining small sewing shops in San Francisco, which has a tremendous history of sewing. I mean, yeah, Levi's styles. Yeah, absolutely. The gap, uh, Esprit, uh, a bunch of brands. And they had sewing factories here in the city um, until, you know, the late, uh, you know, last century now, right? The, the, the late 1990s. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and those, you know, the loss of those factories really accelerated in the early 2000s because outsourcing became very popular. China became, uh, was, became available to uh, U.S. manufacturers to, to manufacture. And so it didn't take long. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, but you know, um, it's it's a hobby and uh, an avocation for me. So uh, I, I tell everybody we'll probably all retire together here. I think the uh, sewing community here is aging out as it is in most cities. I know that uh, Tom Bin, a company that's north of here in in Washington, uh, I think in Se outside of Seattle, I, I, apparently their community sewing community is Vietnamese. But I heard the same thing. Someone, someone saying, yeah, you know, they're not gonna they're not going to find any more sewers. So when those people retire, Tom just retired and sold the company. Yeah. And uh, when those sewers retire, you know, out, it'll be outsourced Man. because, you know, there's no, uh, there's no young, uh, you know, well, there's no university of sewing uh, anywhere. And, uh, and there's no people coming up through the ranks. It's one of you those know, that, things that they just don't teach anymore. Right. No, no. And, you know, um, it, it would, it is a, it is a skill that we, you know, would rely on immigrant labor for, you know, people coming to the United States, you know, once we sort out our immigration policy, but they won't settle in major metropolitan areas because it's too expensive. Yeah. So the people that I have have been in the city, you know, they live in the city, they own their homes, they're very frugal, and uh, they've been here for at least a generation. So, you know, they're, they're already here, they're embedded, but you wouldn't come from the outside um, and say, oh, that looks like an affordable place to live. <laughs> yeah. So, we, uh, so tell me a little bit about how you got started. Like, how long yeah. have you been doing this and what inspired you to start uh, Rickshaw? So, um, and to answer one of your other questions, I grew up, um, I grew up south of here in what the rest of the country would know as Silicon Valley. Hmm, okay. And uh, when there were still apricot orchards uh, there. And, um, but I grew up in suburbia um, in, down south of San Francisco. And San Francisco was always kind of my emerald city. We would we would come up here on occasion with my parents. Uh, my mom had worked in San Francisco when she was just out of college um, in the 1950s. And um, but we would come up to the city to go to a famous toy store here around Christmas or come up for some special event. But it was always like, wow, that's you know, that's the city. And uh never occurred to me actually to live here. And uh, so I started my career as an engineer in Silicon Valley, spent 20 years there. I graduated from Stanford with a mechanical engineering degree, um, worked for a few years, then went back to business school at Stanford. And uh, 
And so series of series of jobs, I ended up at a big company called Cisco Systems. Um, okay. when, a, when a startup that I was working for was acquired by them in 1997. And four years later, we flew into the first major, you know, the, the first dot-com bust, right, in 2001. And so um, I was at a point with Cisco where I, I, was, uh, I was vesting some stock options that, had, that was coming to, a, to an end. And I was like, you know, maybe it's time for me to do something different. So uh, in 2001, I left Cisco, um, decided to take a year off. I, was, I had some other things going on in my life. It was an inflection point in my life and career. And uh, during that year off, I actually started working on a line of journals. I've been, I, I'm an analog journalist, have been for a long, long time. Um, I'll, I'll show you my stack of journals. Uh, I am uh, as well. I'm, I'm sitting here looking at my stack right here as well. Yeah, I've got a whole uh, bookshelf full of them. And so um, uh, Moleskine journals were my thing for a long time. Actually, I started off using uh, just composition notebooks um, and then uh, started using Moleskine journals. But it, but I but I really loved that paper world. And at the time, Moleskine was sort of just taking off. And there was another small uh, notebook company actually here in the Bay Area and I thought, oh, I could get into that business. So I actually hired a design firm and started that project. I worked on it for about four or five months, and uh, it, it came time where I needed to go find a printer. And I thought, well, maybe uh, maybe I'll print them in Hong Kong. That's where everybody seems to. That's where all these books seem to come from. And so I went to see a, a guy I knew who did work in in China um, and Hong Kong. He was in the shoe business, and I said, uh, hey, you know, can you help me find a printer in Hong Kong? <laughs> He was like, no, I don't know anything about that. But while you're, you know, now that you mention it, that you're kind of, you know, thinking about doing something different, I have an investment in a small bag company in San Francisco that needs, um, you know, they're at an inflection point. They're effectively on the edge of bankruptcy. They need more money, but the current investors don't want to put any more money in to the current management team. Hmm. You ought to take a look at it. Maybe you'd like to run the company. And so I said, well, sure, <laughs> I'll take a look at it. So the next day, literally, um, I met with a couple of the key people at, at a company called Timbuktu. And uh, okay. Timbuktu is a, a pretty well-known brand uh, that, that uh, was started here in San Francisco back in uh, 1989. So at the time, it was about 12, 13 years old. This was 2002, so it was 13 years old. And uh, so uh, after I met with them, I was like, wow, this is an opportunity worth setting aside anything that I'm doing to pursue. So I agreed to um, become the CEO of the company to invest some money of my own and to rally the existing investors to put some more money in, find a little extra money that we needed. We got a couple more investors. And so we, I bought the company <laughs> and uh but, you know, I was a minority shareholder and I answered to a board of directors. So the idea was to turn, get the company turned around and ultimately, of course, to sell it uh, because these were investors who, you know, they wanted a return on investment. So, yeah. So anyway, uh, three and a half years later, we ended up selling the business for a for four and a half times what we bought it for. Um, it was a small deal. We bought the company for about four million, sold it for, um, f well, sold it for 20 22, 22 million, 22 and a half million dollars. So, um, and I had a, I had a stake in the business, so I made a little bit of money enough to start my own bag company. And, uh, so, um, about eight months after we sold the company, I parted ways with my new investors. It was a private equity firm and, uh, you know, they really, you know, the private equity guys, they're in there to get four to five times their money in four to five years. And so, they were like, we need someone who can take this company now to a hundred million bucks. And I'm like, well, I've never run a company bigger than the one we're running right now. <laughs> and uh, so they said, well, we're going to go find someone who has. So I said, well, I'm not your man. So um, I left and um, fortunately sold my entire stake to them because shortly thereafter uh, we flew into the recession and yeah. uh, Timbuktu, like all consumer companies, you know, really struggled. 2007, and, 2008. Time yeah, it would have been a long time before I would have been able to sell my stock back to them. And so, you know, I had just decided to kind of cleanly part ways with them. And so I did. 
And, uh, and then I sat on the sideline for a year and enjoyed being a single bon vivant <laughs> in San Francisco. And then I decided to start my own sewing company. I have really fallen in love with the making part of it. And uh, Timbuktu had a, you know, had a factory in San Francisco, actually up until a year and a half ago, they still had their factory here, but they closed it um, kind of a, you know, another casualty of not only of COVID, but of multiple ownership changes. And finally, someone who said, you know, really doesn't make sense to make bags in San Francisco, yeah. um, you know, unless you're doing it on your, you know, like me as a, as a private individual, not as, not with investors. And so, um, so anyway, I started uh, this company with two sewers and, uh, and actually with the help of the founder of Timbuktu, who became my friend because um, I basically saved his life work and he kept his stock in the company while I was running it. And so when we sold the business, he made a nice chunk of change. So that was good. So, so you've had some all... financial flexibility along the way in the long the last yes. 25 years or so to be able to say and do you know, what you wanted. You wanted to start a sewing company. You wanted to start a bag company and you were able to do that 15 yes. years ago. Awesome. Very fortunate, very fortunate to be able to do that and fortunate to be able to keep it going. I mean, uh, COVID was hit us extremely hard um, bef uh, right up till uh, March 16th, 2020, 90% of my business was corporate. So I was making backpacks with the rickshaw brand on them, but co-branded for a number of high-tech companies for onboarding employees. So I made backpacks for two major clients, Airbnb and Stripe, which is a payments technology company. Yeah. Both companies were growing, you know, just uh, incredibly. And so literally was making thousands of backpacks for those two companies. On March 16th at noon, we finished a 300 bag order for Stripe, boxed it up, had it sitting in our, you know, in the, in the, shi in the shipping area. Uh, tomorrow we'll call UPS to pick it up. And at one o'clock, an hour later at one o'clock, our mayor came on and said, oh, you know, about COVID, we're shutting the city down. Uh, nobody's coming to work tomorrow unless you're essential business. Wow. And we were not an essential business. We were just making backpacks right. for high tech companies. And so, um, so I told everyone to go home, um, that we would, you know, see what happens. The mayor said, well, we don't know if this is going to be a couple of weeks, you know, what's going to happen, but everyone's got to, you know, while we sort it out, you got to go home. Little did we know it was going to be, you know, years, right? Man. And so I'm like, okay, well, we're not going to ship these bags because there's no one on the receiving end and we wouldn't do that to our customer. Um, we ultimately shipped them a couple of months later, but, um, but, you know, here we were, okay, well, now what are we going to do? <laughs> so my wife and I decided um, to get into the face mask business because anyone with a sewing machine started doing that. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I checked with a friend of mine who was a pe paramedic and I said, you know, is this legit? I don't want to, I don't want to be a fear monger. I don't want to do this if this is, you know, kind of a dumb thing to do. And he said, no, 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 you, you definitely should do it. If you got sewing machines and sewers, you should get in the mask business. And so we did. And, you know, we got a, we got a nice rush of business um, in the, in the early time of the, of COVID. And, uh, frankly, we couldn't make them fast enough, make them and ship them fast enough. Um, you know, but we were capacity constrained. We only had eight sewers. We could only do so much, but that really got us through the early stages <clears throat> of the pandemic, but that, you know, that leveled off and, and then started to, to fall off pretty quickly, you know, within nine months that was falling off pretty dramatically. Yeah. So, it was just very clear to me that um, we had to really double down on direct to consumer and uh, you know, which we, we, you know, we'd always had direct to consumer, but it'd never been a major part of our business, a nice to have, but not essential. And um, so now it was essential. So I had started, I had already started making pen cases and because I had started collecting fountain pens and um and I'll tell you that story in a second, but, you know, I, I just decided, well, you know, we got to start marketing our stuff. I, I, I consider myself a good marketer, but it's hard, you know, it's like, it I got to run a factory too. And mm -hmm. so, you know, and do I go hire someone to do it for me and, you know, really kind of understand my brand and what I'm trying to do 
And so up to this point, it's been pretty much me, um, you know, as uh, doing everything myself. And so I think I'm going to change that here pretty soon uh, because it's we just really need to we need to energize the business a little bit. We're still operating at 60 percent of where we were pre-COVID. OK. And so that was going to be my next question, actually. That's, uh, you know, and, and we're a small business. We're doing we're doing just about a million dollars a year. That's that's tough. That's not really enough to sustain the the rent and the and the payroll that we have here. So, you know, I, not, I can not where you are exactly. No. And I've been able to fill in the fill in the blanks uh, for right now. But, you know, I don't want to do that forever. I mean, it's important to me to have a sustainable business. Right. Uh, so um, but anyway, that's where we're at today. So your it's plan, fun. what you want to do is you want to move more direct to consumer. What percentage of direct con to, to consumer kind of uh, sales, I guess, what percentage of that do you have right now? Do you think we've completely, we've completely flipped the business. So okay. we're 90, 90 plus percent direct to consumer. Okay. So no, Whereas no we corporate were, clients is all only about 10% then. Yeah. And we get, we still get the occasional corporate client. Uh, we get people who used to work for companies that we've done work for, and now they're working for a new company and say, hey, we want to get some bags. But people aren't onboarding employees the way they used to no, they're not. in the same fashion even, right? I think yeah. many people are now probably onboarded on Zoom, mm -hmm. you know? And it's it's there's less sort of demand for, oh, well, let's put together a big swag kit and ship it to somebody. I mean, it used to be, you know, you bring all the new hires together in the in the cafeteria, give them their swag, Everybody's, you know, commuting, orientation, backpack kind of thing, yeah. on, orientation, all that stuff. And now mm -hmm. it's just completely changed. And uh, and I'm OK with that. I don't I mean, I, I like the corporate business, but, you know, I'm here to build the rickshaw brand. And so, you know, to the extent that um, we're we're now direct to consumer, I, I like that. We just we need a little more traction. Absolutely. So, well, we let's people like you to sing our praises. <laughs> well, let's I want to sing the praises because I've got some stuff right here. And I tell <laughs> well, I you what, man, these are hey, look at I, I can tell you I can show that to the, the video, the, the viewers there. He was yeah. so gracious. Mark was so gracious. He put my logo on these things. They've got this wicked. Uh, he even asked me what colors I wanted. And so these are actually um, now are these a new product? These yeah, are that's, a, that's a new product. Okay. I mean, we've, we make lots of pouches, but that I thought, um, so, so I, so I started collecting fountain pens about mm, seven years ago, a couple of years before COVID hit, I started collecting fountain pens. I've Why got my fountain nice pens in there right here, right yeah. here. Right. Yeah. Very nice. So I w originally bought a couple of pens on Kickstarter projects and the, and, uh, one of them was from Karis, Bill Karis, Karis Customs, and they were doing machined, uh, rollerball pens, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the attractions to me was, oh, these are makers like me, you know, they're, they're machinists where, you know, in my, my world is sewing machines, theirs is lathes and, and milling machines. But I like the whole ethos of making, and I wanted to support them. Um, and so, and Kickstarter, what an amazing platform. I wish it had existed when I was much younger and wanting to be an entrepreneur, because it would have been a lot easier to start a business. But, um, but anyway, so, um, uh, I, I supported a couple of their uh, rollerball pen campaigns and then they came out, they did a fountain pen. I'm like, okay, well, I'll get a fountain pen. I have a, I have a one fountain pen, a Mont Blanc that someone gave me for graduation. I think everybody Eons starts ago. with a Mont Blanc actually, yeah. you know, never used, I, I used with. it maybe once and got ink all over my hand and said, this is ridiculous. <laughs> and so, um, so anyway, um, you know, I bought one. And then I started seeing, you know, I started exposing myself to the community that is the fountain pen community, a small but very active community and, you know, a a small portion of the overall EDC community. And uh, I just got into it. And so I ended up finding out, oh, they have a fountain pen show. Matter of fact, they have quite a few fountain pen shows and they have one in San Francisco every year. So I went to my first fountain pen show in 2018, I think it was, and I was like, wow, people here spend as much money on a fountain pen as they spend on a laptop computer. It is computer. crazy, isn't it? Yeah. I went to my first pen show in Denver last year. I just happened oh, to be you? in Denver and there was a, I was at a, on a business trip and there was a fountain pen show there. My friend who is actually, um, he lives a town over about mm -hmm. 20 minutes away and he is a fountain pen nut. And he's like, hey, you should check out the Denver pen show. You're there. And I, I was probably like, know okay. him. <laughs> but it was great. And he actually yeah. was the one that told me about you guys initially uh, several yeah. years ago now. 
And uh, I've always known, but yeah, that's a really cool, you know, little thing. And I've obviously these, these pouches are, are, I, I saw your Instagram post. It was a little bit interesting how the algorithm brought us together, I think. Right. Because I saw your Instagram post and I thought, I'm going to go get one of those. I'm going to go get two or three because they're very, very cost effective. You're not selling these things for like, you know, 80 or 90 bucks here. These are oh. very cost effective and uh, they're perfect because I was looking for something exactly like it because so many people, I think these are going to really appeal to um, the EDC community because you talk about fountain pens, people costing a lot on fountain pens. Yeah. You have seen some of these knives that are three, oh, yeah. four, five, six hundred bucks. And these little plush pouches are going to be perfect for that uh, to fit some of these knives, man. And, and especially, you know, I like to, I've got my little, I've got some of my big eye design uh, or um, yep. yeah, d d uh, tactile, tactile turn. turn. Yeah. yeah. I've got some of my tactile turn special editions here and I love theirs and um, yep. they're just a perfect, I mean, perfect little size. And uh, again, thank you for sending these, but uh, I, I saw that initially, but you guys make a lot more stuff. And you sent me, by the way, you sent me a very gracious box. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're quite um, welcome. And uh, you've got, so I've got a couple of different colorways of the um, the micro plush. So the, here's the micro plush pouch, of course. And I'm trying to, I'm just going to give this a kind of a overview for our viewers here. And they've got it. I mean, it, let me ask you this question. Can you order these? Um, with any color and any logo that, that you would yes. like on them? Well, you can order them with any in any color combination. Okay. Uh, the logo I, I put on there for you. Okay. I, uh, one, of, one, of our, uh, one of my expertises here is printing fabric. And so um, I, do, I use a process called dye sublimation. If you know the company Ripstop by the Roll. Oh, yeah. Great. I have not met them personally, but they're, they're doing a great business. They are doing dye sublimation as well. I just do it for myself. And so um, I print on roll to roll uh, on fabrics or print on, on small pieces of fabric, but I have the capability to print roll to roll as they do. And so I've really made that, I've become a real student of that over the last, we've been, I've been doing it for now about eight, nine years. Um, and uh, so printing fabric is, uh, it allows us to do what I did for you, which is take your logo, put it on our product and do it without a bunch of fuss, right? Yeah. I, there's, it's not screen printing. I didn't have to create a screen. It's all digital. Um, I can choose any colors that I want. There's no penalty uh, for having multiple colors the way you do with screen printing. And, uh, and so um, it allows me to do, you know, very fast custom jobs like that. And so, um, you know, so that's, that's, that's how that happened. Okay. Uh, but that, got, so the the but pen that, show, that's really so neat. Went, the way that you can do that, because this kind of customization, I mean, I don't think not possible 10 years ago. And the no, way that and, you're... And really difficult even today if you're using a contract manufacturer, because they're yes. going to say, well, you know, what, what, you know, how many do you want, right? The minimum is X, right? Yeah. So I tell people here, the, the big idea at Rickshaw is the unit of one. Once I have a digital artwork file and a digital cutting file for the actual product, they live in digital world. And all I have, you know, when someone comes to me and says, well, I want, I want that item in that color or that print, I go print it and we cut it and we make it. And um, it's very easy to do that. And again, back to this sort of why we don't have, you know, drops where we're doing these, oh, there's only a hundred of these. It's because I build a business where I can build the unit of one anytime I want. Hmm. And so, you know, in the morning when we have, when we collect up all our uh, orders on from, from the internet, we just go, I go down through the orders. I print out the fabric, each of the, each of the designs we need, send it off to sewing and then we ship them out. And that so, is going to be music yeah. to a lot of people's ears if they want to get their hands on your products, because so often all I hear is, I can't get it. It's sold out. I can't get on the drop. I'm not going to wait for the drop. I got to be right on there at seven o'clock hitting the button and I got to be able to do all that stuff. You guys don't operate like that. So I'd consider that a big positive for sure. Yeah. And, and the prices for those are fairly high. And if you miss the yes. drop and you really want it, you're going to go pay three to 10 times that on, on eBay. Yeah. And so, you know, I think that that whole dynamic though, I appreciate it. And I see, you know, I, I, I see how it works, but it's, it's kind of depressing because, you know, we're such a, we're, we're such a consumer and acquiring 
you know, acquiring species and um, people get all worked up about this stuff. And I'm like, whoa, calm down, everybody. <laughs> exactly. Rick, Rickshaw can help you. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about, I want to talk about, firstly, this one right here. Yes, and the Diplomat. This is cool because it is big enough. And you've got, I want you to tell me about the notebooks in here as well, because these are part of your Kickstarters. The yes. Dots Plus and the lined notebooks that you have. And is this a side? Is this kind of a side business called Efficiency Supply? Well, it was. It was going to be. I okay. mean, it was, the, the idea was, you know, did did paper products really live within Rickshaw? And so I was like, oh, okay, for this Kickstarter, I'm going to come up with this little sub brand called Efficiency Supply. Uh, you know, <laughs> managing one brand is hard enough. Yes. And and so you know, it just became pretty obvious shortly thereafter. I'm like, you know, what am I doing? It's it's just a Rickshaw product. I am Rickshaw. Uh, I'm not Rick Shaw. I am Mark Dwight, but you know, it, the, the company is mine, and it's and it's a manifestation of my hobbies and interests, um, which tend to be quite analog, whether it's pens or or paper or you know all this stuff, and and you know, so um, so I aban abandoned the efficiency supply thing, but um, and just said, look, it's part of the system. And so the next round of notebooks we do will be rickshaw notebooks. But neat. that that so I've got project, a limited edition here. Is that what you're trying to tell me? Yeah, you do. You have <laughs> yes, very limited. And you, <laughs> I'll put it on get eBay them up fast. <laughs> <laughs> but these are uh, the dots of, plus um, pattern is something that I came up with uh, as well. So okay, this is X pack, uh, is it not? Or is it a is yeah it that a... Uh, that is uh, EPX actually. That EPX, is challenge okay. challenges the challenge. Outdoor is a company that is now making uh, sailcloth for the outdoor industry. Um, and so that is a material that we use in addition to uh, XBAC from Dimension Polyant. But, uh, and for the viewers, uh, thought, I'm going to have some B-roll of this running while we're on the video, and I'm going to okay. show the details of this. But it's got you've got Velcro here, a, a loop on the front, and you've got a big pocket in the back. But then that center pocket, you could actually – you had two field notes size notebooks in there. Yeah, you can, can actually fit. fit three in there. Yeah, so, so I was I was yeah. wondering about that, and that's field notes is what I have used, or field note size is what I have used for years and yeah. years. But that is just really super handy right there. I was. Very I thought you'd like that because you you mentioned uh, I think somewhere either in writing or on your one of your videos that you use field notes, and uh, I thought that would be a good thing for you to try out. I and do. You can put one, of your, one of your nice tactile turns in the front there, and yeah. Uh, and I've got an episode uh, coming up um, on specifically on EDC items for, you know, analog note taking kind of stuff oh, like cool. that. And because I'm a huge note taker, you said you had a big stack of books and everything. So this is the same. Is this the same material right here? This is a snap wallet. Yeah, that's the snap wallet. OK, and snap this is the wallet. same material. But that, got... is, that is that is X-Pack. So okay. the, the way you can tell the difference is X-Pack has that diamond shape pattern that you have in your hand. Yeah. EPX has a square pattern, so it's they're not diamond shaped; they're square. And I think oh, okay, I, I got you. Yeah. Yeah, so you can it's a very subtle difference and hard to see on the black material, of course, because okay. can't see can't see the cross threads in the middle. But um, but anyway, that's the cross ply on X pack is diamond shaped, and on EPX it's square. So the field notes folio now, and I didn't actually look these two up, but did these come in different colors? The uh, snap wallet. Yeah, you can get them in any any of our materials in okay. any colors. And so these, they've got a, a nice little snap there. And of course you uh, included another, um, oh, you included another bonus gift in there, but it's got a really cool little portfolio here. And yeah. uh, that's that f high fluorescent orange kind of color snaps together right there. And it's a really flexible, um, I dare say, and this is actually x pack because it's the diamond pattern. So yeah. thanks for that mm -hmm. tip. I will always remember that now. <laughs> and, uh, and that's, I mean, that's really cool. That's normally what I use. I've got a, um, somewhere around here, I've got, I normally use kind of one of these, uh, just a little leather cover mm -hmm. for, for yep. um, some of the, some of the everyday notebooks I carry around. But this is really cool and would, uh, I guess it's a little, it's water resistant, water waterproof, right? Yeah, the sailcloth itself is waterproof. Of course, it's uh, it doesn't have a waterproof enclosure there, right. but it's designed to be, you know, protect your, protect your notebook when it's, you know, you're at the, you know, out to lunch or at a bar or something and there's something on the table. Yeah, uh, that's a wipe. Clean. You can wipe clean that. And also, 
you know, just to kind of give a little more life to the paper cover because those things get pretty, you know, pretty banged up. Yeah. Uh, I love putting stickers on my notebooks, but, you know, that kind of protects the notebook from getting before you retire it into it, the, uh, into your archive, keeps it in one piece. So I've and got there's one here. That... There's an elastic loop in there for your pen, too, if you under the cover there Actually, in the yeah. front. Oh, yeah. You can didn't slide even, it. I didn't even notice that. It's right there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, okay. and uh, it, it, with a, with a uh, you know, a pen, you know, a, a kind of standard stick pen, like you like your tactile turn, that'll fit nicely in there and it won't bulge too much. You can still snap it shut. It just keeps everything together so you know where your pen's at. That's really cool. It's really That's the cool. Idea. Well, I've already put some of these things to use and I'm going to, I'm going to absolutely keep using this. This is what's called the dash wallet. Yep. Tell us about this. This has just got your, your hook and loop on the front. Uh, this is an interesting, um, I wouldn't say interesting necessarily. That's, that may be the wrong word to use, but it's a, um, it's a different kind of zipper than you normally would see on some yes. of these things. And I kind of like that. So I'll tell you the reason for that. The reason is that coil zippers, the usual kind of zipper, it's a continuous coil and you have to, you have to bend it around the, each end. And okay. this is a, this is a, um, the, the plastic teeth on this zip, this zipper is made to length. And so it has fabric extending beyond the teeth. So the fabric goes nicely into the seam without having to bend the zipper portion. Okay. And it's much and faster to me and more fluid than, than a yeah. normal zipper would be. We don't, you know, we use coil zippers all the time on lots of other stuff. But for this application, I felt that that style of zipper was more appropriate and allowed the wallet to sit flatter. Yeah. And uh, because when you when you bend the coil around the edge, you know, when you effectively crease the coil, make a you know hard U-turn, it, it's, it doesn't like that. You know, it's, it's not made to work that way. So these that this kind of a plastic tooth zipper is a uh, is appropriate for this application and it, it's almost like a, a more of an old school zipper on there you used to see those mm -hmm. zippers a whole lot and yep. it's kind of like going back a little bit but th your reasoning is is sound there and it's really nice to be able to just uh, the main complaint that i have with uh waterproof you know i've got a i carry a bellroy here it is i carry a bellroy sometimes and this is a recent acquisition but it's got these waterproof zippers that are just hard to get in and out of when i need they to get are. in and out of my wallet it's got these waterproof zippers which great it's great it's, that it's waterproof and everything but it's so tough even worn in it's so tough to get in and out of and something like this and they me, wear out as it turns out because exactly. the the waterproof the waterproofing if you will or really the just kind of weatherproofing it's not waterproof because they they will leak but it's accomplished by putting a polyurethane film on the top of a normal zipper right and so that polyurethane film is put on there with a heat with a heat press and it will peel off over time so what if you've ever had a jacket or something that had mm -hmm. those kinds of zippers and you've had it for 10 years and put it through the wash you'll see that stuff start to peel off yep and it starts to just expose the normal zipper the zipper will still work but it looks a little tacky mm -hmm. because it's because the stuff is sloughing off. And um, and so I, I have a whole write up about those style of zippers on our website because we get asked for them all the time. And I tell people, um, especially on our uh, handlebar bags for bicycles, I'm like, you will find that it is a lot harder to unzip it, especially when you're riding your bicycle. Keep your eyes on the road. Don't be looking at the zipper trying to fuss with it because um, like you say, the resistance is a lot greater. And, uh, I'm going to go really... on the record, Mark, and, and say that you're starting a trend <laughs> right now. I'm going to say it, that the, the next, the next all good pouch or some of the garage guilt built gear guys are going to look at this and they're going to go, Oh, we got to, we got to do that. We got to find some way to incorporate those. That's great. Yeah, most, that most people go, we know all about those. He doesn't know anything <laughs> that we don't. <laughs> is it, but um, it, it's an appropriate use for that style. Yeah. Is it? yeah. Okay, let's keep going here. I've got just a thing, and you sent some of these um, these bags with the. I love the the cat, the Chinese, Chinese yes, cat the, symbol. The lucky those. cat. That's fun. Lucky cat, and that's uh, kind of our just, spirit animal here. Yeah, and these. I mean, you gotta. I mean, you gotta embrace that. If you're in San Francisco, you, you gotta <laughs> embrace that. Um, but these are just regular, just regular, nice, fairly large bags. And, so um, they're fun little fun little mini pouches. Where that came from was we, we like to give away kind of a gift with purchase. Um, 
And for a long time, I would, you know, some, if someone ordered a bunch of pen sleeves, I would throw in an extra sleeve, maybe, you know, that is the same color scheme that we noticed in their order or something like that. And then, you know, but we have lots of customers who we don't know if they're pen collectors because they're buying, a, you know, some other bag that's completely unrelated to pens. Right. So I thought, you know, what could we give people away, give to people that, that anyone can use and that what anyone would be comfortable re-gifting if they've already received one or, you know, they don't need it or whatever, but it's not going to get thrown away. And but it should have some branding because we're giving it to you. Um, so it should be something that you kind of go, oh, yeah, you got that from Rickshaw. So we make those. I'm not sure if I should say how many colors, because on our on our fan page on Facebook, someone was speculating how many colors does Rickshaw make these in? Well, and he I've reached out four to, of them. He reached out to me and I told him, he says, oh, I thought it was like a dozen. <laughs> no, it's yeah, a lot. I've got more. four at least orange, yep. pink, bl uh, turquoise and black. So those are going to come in handy for sure. Uh, but but my just family will be purpose. using them. My wife will love those. Yeah. I thought your kids might like those too. Absolutely. I mean, it's just general purpose. Everyone needs a little zipper pouch to put something in, right? Absolutely. And so anyway, we started making that kind of our gift with purchase. You can't buy that particular one. You can buy the size, but you can't buy the Lucky Cat on our website. It's strictly for us to give away to people uh, when we give, give them away with orders of the certain size. Well, so. last question. What do you think about, what? Are, what is on the horizon? I, I know you can't necessarily talk about upcoming projects necessarily or anything like that, but what, what is on the horizon or what would you like to um, specifically promote maybe as a product uh, here as we kind of wrap up? Well, um, I mean, our, one of our best selling products is our Sutro backpack. And you, you had asked in your email, you know, what's my favorite EDC or, you know, what is my, what is my EDC? And my EDC is a backpack, a Sutro, my Sutro backpack. I've been carrying it for 10 years, same one. Um, is that the one right behind you, actually? Uh, it's that, That's the style, yes. Okay. Um, my bag is hanging on a hook out in the main office. But um, I like I like carrying it. I could carry a smaller bag, but I like having the flexibility to have some extra room if I need it. So I go to my wife and I go to the farmer's market every weekend, and the bag is constructed in a way that I can open up the top and have stuff sticking out of the top if I want, you know, long loaf of bread or whatever, overstuff the bag. Um, but um, that is um, that is the thing I use every day. Um, but I do have I do have a new product that's coming out. It's a collaboration actually okay. with um, with Retro Fifty One, which is a pen company. Yes, um, you know Retro. We we have a we have a um, partnership with Retro where we make pen sleeves for many of their pens uh, as they as the new designs come out. Um, if uh, they have a program where you can do exclusive designs, so um, Rickshaw can do a pen with Retro with a with a design on it if we want to. And we have done one already, um, The uh, what we call the no borrow pen. It says, no, you cannot borrow my pen on, a, on the barrel. <laughs> uh, but we have a new one coming out in a few weeks. And as a matter of fact, I'm hoping to send you a sample of it. Okay. Uh, and I will show it to you today. Uh, okay, it's never, great. Never been seen before. Exclusive here to the channel. All right. By anyone but me and uh, some people in the office. But, uh, you know, the, the Sigeha wave pattern is very popular right now. Yes. Uh, Urban EDC Supply um, frequently features uh, exclusive products with uh, their own version of the wave pattern and and then the classic version, which is just the stacks of... Uh, and that's kind of the... It looks like the sand art pattern almost, right? So it's it's this pattern here, if Ooh, you can that's see. That's nice. Right? That's the Sigeha pattern. Yeah. So uh, this is a case that we're making to go with this pen here. Oh, this nice. This is a retro pen. And we have etched into the barrel the Sigeha pattern all the way around continuously, so there's no there's no seam on it. No breaks, nice. And it's got a, a really beautiful, well, it's got a great feel, first off. That etching is, it's kind of like if you're a letterpress person, you know, you really like that tactile, mm -hmm. uh, uh, embossed feeling of letterpress. Well, same effect here. This is an etched, um, an etched surface, so you get that three-dimensionality. It's nice and smooth on the grip and it just looks really elegant uh we we're doing a white nickel finish here which has kind of a kind of a golden glow to it it's not shimmer it's not, yeah not bright white it's uh it's got a little uh, a little golden nature almost to like it. a brushed look almost yeah and it, it's a matte finish and then we've got the matching pencil uh as well oh, they make see you said the pencil that's yeah. that's oh man <laughs> so anyway that's the pair and then we're doing a and then we're doing this special 
case for them as well. That's so cool. And so match all your this, stuff right there. You saw it first here. Wow. On Chad Landman's channel. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that. And when but anyway, do you have a date for those or? Uh, they will come out uh, right before the San Francisco Pen Show in August, about a week before. Um, we have uh, Retro likes to have people sign up for various launch dates, uh, and so so that not everybody launches on the same day and right. and kind of you know confuses things. So ours is in August. Um, we'll, we'll announce it ourselves in advance, but um, I'm going to send you one of these so you can play around with it. Um, Retro makes for the for their price point of you know. 30 to 60 or $65, they make really good, good pens. They really and do. I've been in business for a long time. Uh, the founder sold the company just a couple of years ago to a new, a group of enthusiasts, actually, three three guys that were uh, uh, retro collectors and enthusiasts. And uh, in that in that sale, um, we kind of reconnected with them. I had tried to get connected with retro before, but uh, you know, not knowing that the founder was retiring, so he kind of wasn't all that interested. But the new guys were like, "Oh yeah, we know, we know Rickshaw, and we'd love to work with you." And so we've got a really nice partnership. And so we're we're embarking actually on a series of pens uh, using uh, classic Japanese uh, pat repeating patterns. The Sigeha being arguably the most popular. The second being Asanoa, uh, which is that sort yes. of uh, hexagonal with cross cross hatches in it. Mm -hmm. um, so. We're going to do a series of pens like this one with that etched uh, that etched finish, and so anyway, that's the first one. That's awesome. That we'll see how awesome. it goes. Hopefully, they'll sell it. It's a limited edition of 500, so there there is a a place where there's a there's a minimum purchase, and the collectors really like them to be numbered and limited, and so we're gonna we're gonna go with that. So that's good. That's that's awesome. And again, thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, you bet. Last question for you before we sign off. Yeah. This is the most important one. What's your favorite part of San Francisco? My favorite part of San Francisco is, of course, where Rickshaw is, and that's a neighborhood called Dogpatch. Dogpatch voted one of the best neighborhoods uh, in America, like you were talking about your city. Well, San Francisco is getting a little bit of a um, getting a knock right now, but um, Dogpatch, a neighborhood in San Francisco, is a great little neighborhood. It's the old shipbuilding neighborhood, so it's got a great okay. maker kind of maker uh, ethos, you know, and background to it. Um, used to be a very muddy kind of detached from the city. It was all industrial, but now is, of course, one of the fastest growing residential neighborhoods as we convert all the old shipyards and warehouses to condominiums. So it's definitely changing. Um, but we're one of the holdouts who are actually still making things in Dogpatch and and you gotta love the name, Dog Pass. Uh, you gotta love that. That's awesome. It's got a great, great, great brand just to start. So, well, Mark, I thank if I'm you. Starting so over, much. I might call it Dog Patch Bags, but uh, oh you know, yeah, if you if you had to, if you had to start over, you'd call it that for sure. <laughs> that's right. You didn't know where you were gonna end up necessarily, so that's right. I did not. <laughs> Well, Mark, thank you so much for joining us here on the channel. Really appreciate you sending me all these things to review. And also, uh, we're going to be doing dedicated videos on most of these uh, later. Mark is the founder and CEO, of course, of Rickshaw Bags. And he can be found at Rickshaw Bags. What did I have at RickshawBags.com? Yep, RickshawBags.com. And uh, we will figure out... Uh, something how to get uh, some, something kind of a promo going here, but he's got go visit rickshaw bags. They've got all sorts of different things and you are with the micro plush pouches dabbing into EDC. It's perfect for pocket knives. So make sure you go check those out. And uh, again, thank you, Mark, so much for your time. And thank you for telling us all about your, your business. My pleasure, Chad. It's great to uh, meet you over Zoom and uh, hope to see you in San Francisco sometime. We'll get you on a tour of the factory. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Mark. Appreciate it. All right. It. Thanks, man.